I'm not giving up hope on Tim Lincecum becoming a good major league pitcher again, but I think it's time to start looking seriously if he's ever going to be the Tim Lincecum of old. Tim Lincecum used to be the most dominant pitcher in all of baseball. He rose to dominance when in his first two full professional seasons, he won back-to-back -back Cy Young Awards. He became a mythological figure, a David vs. Goliath. His delivery was anything short of iconic, and his stuff overwhelmingly shocking for a man of his stature. You couldn't help yourself but to deem him as a freak. He grew his fame by defying the odds of a prototypical power pitcher and solidifying his reputation by his performance on the field. His future was bright, but now it's looking dimmer. Linscombe has now experienced a prolonged period of failure. As he approaches 30, what lies ahead for the former Cy Young Award winner? Can he regain his dominance? Is he destined for the bullpen? How many years can he continue to beat the odds? The game of baseball catches up to us all, as Father Time is undefeated. But the game of baseball is also about making adjustments and Tim Lincecum can make adjustments by listening and learning from his predecessors. Let's face it, Lincecum has really struggled the last couple of seasons. He had a 5.18 ERA in 2012 and allowed more earned runs than any pitcher in the National League. This year, he's 3-5 and five with an ERA of 5.12. It's when we talk about Tim Lincecum, because you know what? There's a chance he's just not that good anymore. Can Lincecum turn the tables, find the form that's made him one of the games great the last several seasons? And try to, with those kind of mechanics that you try to figure out, we don't know, you, it's tough to, for a pitching coach to say, is it mechanical? <laughs> is it not? Or what's, what's the difference in that velocity? Looking at his velocity, his fastball velocity averaged between 91 and 92 miles per hour the past two seasons, but this year it's not even cracking 90 miles per hour. Remember what he did during the last postseason. In 2012, in October, coming out of the bullpen, 13 innings, five hits allowed, just one run, two walks, and 17 strikeouts. He was an incredible weapon coming out of the bullpen for them. And at some point, if they can get another starting pitcher, that may be the direction that the Giants choose to take. When you acknowledge, all right, I don't have the same strength in my arm, therefore I have to find another way, that almost makes you find another way. Does that come back to your rhythm or mechanics? Uh, more just rhythm, you know, and just uh, you know, timing of when my, my foot's hitting and where my arm's at when, I, when it is. And, you know, it's not doing it consistently, so you know, that's what I said. It's got to go back to the, to the mound and start working on some things again. I agree Tim Lincecum needs to work on a few things. And the few things that I've come up with are a product of me preparing by gathering video evidence from the time that he was at the University of Washington to his 2008-2009 Cy Young Award years all the way into his most recent struggles in 2012 and 2013. Tim Lincecum is a guy with a very dynamic delivery, lots of moving parts, and I wanted to make sure that when I talked about the adjustments that he needed to make, that I really fully understood the complete pattern, and if that pattern had changed anywhere along the line from the time he was drafted until now where he's starting to struggle and experience failure. The truth is, the biggest difference I have seen in Tim Lincecum's pattern over the years is how much he over-rotates as he gets into his lift position. And this has everything to do with his timing, his tempo, his rhythm, and his stride alignment as he moves into his pitch. That being said, the position that Tim Lincecum gets when his front foot lands is fairly consistent from the time that he was in college all the way to 2013. And the biggest difference now is he's older and he just may not be as quick and he can't overcompensate from some of the deficiencies 
that present itself as he moves into his throw. Just in order to fear baseball rebellion, and you are looking at Tim Lincecum on the left from 2013. I believe it's a clip from April of this year when he puts a shutout versus the Padres. And then a clip on your right uh, from Tim Lincecum back in July 4th, actually, of 2009. So what I wanted to do was have a clip from 2009 when he won his Cy Young and a clip here from 2013 recently to see what the commonalities in this delivery are and what the differences may be. And in preparation for this article, I've gone back through Lincecum's mechanics from University of Washington um, through 2008, 2009, his Cy Young Awards, and this particularly 2012 and 2013 when he's struggled. And we're, we're going to go through these videos and we're going to try to see what differences we may see, if any. Okay, so we're going to start off of how he approaches his lift. So we're going to go to kind of the top here where he gets into his lift. There. So the biggest thing to note right away is when I look at the clip on the left here, I can see a lot more of Tim Lincecum's face than I can here on the right. Now his hair is shorter here on the left than it is here on the right, but one thing that is also visible is I can almost, the Giants, okay, it, I can almost read it clear as day. It's like looking at me. Here it's more of an angle. So his shoulders here in the, in the 2013 clip are clearly more rotated than they are over here at 2009. So he's doing a much better job of keeping his shoulders aligned with home plate as he comes up into his lift. All right. The next thing to notice is his knee position is relatively similar, but if you start looking ahead at his foot, his foot here is more towards center field as his foot here would be more towards shortstop. And that becomes even more clear as he kicks out of it. You can see where his foot goes as where his foot goes here when he kicks out. So you can see it's more outside of his body which tells you that in this clip over here in 2009, his lower half and his shoulders, really particularly his shoulders, are going to be better aligned as he separates his hands and he starts moving towards home plate. Okay, So it's clear the biggest thing, and Linscombe's talked about it himself, you know, his, his feel, his timing, his rhythm, he's, he's tinkered probably a decent amount with how much he rotates his shoulders into his lift, but it's here in most recent years, 2012, 2013, where he started a little bit over rotating his torso and his shoulders comparatively to when he first broke into the league, his shoulders stayed on target initially longer. Okay, so now let's move in to how, how he breaks his hands. And the biggest thing here. Linscombe's always had a really long arm swing that kind of wraps behind his back and kind of shoots out. Okay, It actually shot out more uh, back in 2009 than it does here in 2013. Maybe he's made more of a commitment to try to keep his arm in the front plane of his body. Okay, But you can see as he gets stretched out, there's definitely more length here outside and a little bit higher with his front side than it is here as he breaks. His front side's a little lower and his arm's down here. So you can see he's doing a better job of really matching here in his positions even though he's really stretched out. And here his arm's out and he's not quite matching like he did back in 2009. Now the biggest thing here is how and really in terms of his timing and his separation how his arm swing works with his separation of his body. So when you initially go up into more rotation, you're breaking your hands, it's harder to repeat an efficient process of getting the arm, the front side, in particular your lower half, to line up properly every time. Now this is a game here that we have to where Lincecum 
uh, pitched a great game. He pitched a shutout, so his, his timing here was probably better. But we can see that the inconsistencies are definitely there between where he was here when he was more dominant. Now, one thing that he's always done that I've found from the time that he was young all the way until now is if we really look at his back heel going forward, okay, we can see, let's backtrack this here, we can definitely see where his heel is in terms of where his stride becomes, that he has always landed closed off with his stride. Okay, so he's always landed close. There's his front foot hitting. There's his front foot hit, hitting here. And if you look at where the heel came up from here and here, you can see that he's landed almost a foot close in both clips. And this makes him go into tons of thoracic extension here, which he already does naturally, but since he is so closed, this becomes over exaggerated and you can see how much bend in his lower back he gets. Now one of the things that you'll learn from the, the article here is over here in 2009 his arm was quicker and he is more he's more prone and it's easier for him to kind of get back centered towards home plate because the amount of arm speed he's able to generate. Here he's not he's not throwing as hard he doesn't have as much arm speed and there's where the, the inconsistency will arise in terms of the release point out front, okay? But his stride has always been closed. He's always been able to kind of right at foot strike, kind of get matched up, but it's how quickly he can get his arm and his torso downwards toward home plate to generate his force. And, you know, in terms of consistency, he was able to get away with it here back in 2009, and now the inconsistency and the lack of command is showing up in 2013 uh, due to a closed off stride and a little inconsistent timing. Okay, so just to recap, the biggest difference in terms of 2009 and 2013, honestly, was just some over rotation early, which affects how he breaks his hand, how his leg shoots out and his shoulder in his direction towards home plate. He's always landed close, but now because his arm's not quite as quick, it's harder for him to make up for it at the end. Let's explore how Tim Lincecum's initial movement of how he moves into his delivery stacks up to his predecessors. Justin Orndorff here, Baseball Rebellion. And we're going to go into step one of fixing the freak, which deals with the timing, the rhythm, and the tempo of the delivery. And we're going to start with Tim Lincecum here on the left, 2013 clip. Just wanted to make sure it was something recent because we're talking about the adjustments that he may have to make to further uh, prolong his career to stay competitive and to stay at the top of his game. And so we're going to start by looking at Tim Lincecum and how he moves into his lift, okay? So as he moves into his lift, he kind of starts his hands low and he pulls his knee really to almost his back shoulder. And as he does this, he rotates his entire torso, over rotating his shoulders and bringing his knee back towards center field, okay? So this is his move as he starts to prepare to separate his hands and move into the pitch. And now what we want to do is compare the same movement of how uh, the pitcher gets into his lift with Lincecum's predecessors who have all pitched well into their 30s, potential Hall of Famers, Hall of Famers, and guys who were considered power pitchers early in their career and as they continue to pitch, especially after 30, had to become more of command guys and rely on their mechanics to maintain efficiency and put up consistent results. So we're going to start here with Roger Clemens, and this is early in his career. And Clemens moves into his list by going overhead, and as he comes to the top, 
his hands come down and he meets in the middle okay but the key thing is here and I think what you'll see is most common here with the predecessors is notice Clemens shoulders are still right towards the target okay he's not over rotated like Lincecum you can see the differences in the knees and how the shoulders line up the glove maintains in the center of the body where Lincecum is towards his right hip okay so now we're going to move into David Cohn Cohn comes up there's the top of his lift his hands still maintained in the center of his body again here shoulders are lined up towards the target knees not over rotated similar to Clemens we'll move into the next predecessor which would be Mike Mussina Mussina goes in brings the knee up he almost kind of balls up everything comes centered again gloves in the center knees at the top of the lift here once again shoulders are lined up towards the target Pedro Martinez let me move this over so we can see it a little better Pedro as he comes to the top here his hands are a little bit higher but still within the center of his body and again his shoulders are lined up directly towards home plate here's Tom Seaver he's another overhead guy just like Clemens everything comes centered okay high lift hands are in the center again shoulder angles aligned directly towards home plate definitely no over rotation and our last is Kurt Schilling everything comes centered knees at the top shoulders square so the biggest thing I want, want you to take away from here is every single one of these guys here it got to the position just a little bit differently but as they came into the lift generally the hands were at the center of the body and the shoulders remained square towards the target where Lincecum's shoulders were over rotated his hips were turned okay and so there's a distinct difference here of how Lincecum moves into his pitch and how these guys move into their pitch and honestly the way that Lincecum moves into the pitch with this over rotation you've already seen it's different from 2009 is just a wasted movement he's not doing anything in here he's not really loading his hips there's no added benefit by over rotating early so now we want to look at how the arm comes out of the glove and to me this is the most important deal and this is what I call the arm swing so Lincecum arm swings comes out it remains very rigid very long kind of hangs out behind his right hip he's not going anywhere as he's moving okay so it's it's not fluid everything's not moving together okay and this is part of his timing and rhythm sometimes when he over rotates his hand will get stuck back here and then he's got to make up for it quicker than he has to so it leads to a lot of timing issues and that's why he talks to and he's so try to big on finding a good rhythm and timing before he goes out to the mound and this is just a hard move initially to to really kind of overcompensating kind of move into from because this leads to a lot of timing and rhythm issues just because you're over rotated and then everything has got to be back and center and you have to be absolutely perfect now we're going to go through these pretty quickly but you can see as as Clemens comes out here very fluid everything works together very very nicely look how his hand is staying over the ball all the way until he kind of gets right into where his front foot hits let's go into David Cohn now with Cohn here his arm action starts off uh, the closest I could find to Lincecum so if you really look at these positions look similar but what you can see from Cohn one it's always moving together and it gets right up into that good position as his body is moving it doesn't hang out by his hips everything's moving together Lucina who has a very clean arm swing here's how his arm moves out notice it's always moving never gets behind his back everything kind of stays in the frontal plane of his body very good timing and rhythm here 
and as he approaches foot strike, everything moves together. So very, very good example there. Pedro, low three-quarter guy, one of the best kind of arm actions, arm swings that I've seen, how everything stays fluid, very efficient. He's one that had the better commands here, the predecessors that we're talking about. Very, very good there. Receiver, same thing. Everything moving together as one piece. And lastly, Kurt Schilling, very short and efficient. As he got older in his career, you say probably the shortest of the arm actions here. Very fluid, everything working together. And the same thing is here. All these guys' arm swings went with the body, and the timing became absolutely ideal as the front foot hits. I think the biggest uh, one for me is when I take my long stride towards home plate and you know my lower body is on the target while my upper body isn't. Uh, yeah, I think I just felt that sync at times. Um, you know, mechanically, uh, I felt I was there maybe you know, close to like 70% of the time and the other times I was, you know, kind of leaking my, my shoulder and or, uh, you know, dragging my, or actually blocking myself with my hip. I don't really want to explain that right now. But. Just in order to fear baseball rebellion, and we're going into step two of fixing the freak, which has to do with stride alignment. And the biggest thing to take away from here, if you're watching the video, is Lenticum himself talks about one of the kind of scariest things is, is as he moves his hips forward directly towards home plate, his upper half is closed, which we've talked about. It is closed. It over rotates. But really, because he over-rotates, his hips and his direction is thrown off. And he ends up landing with his stride way more closed off, probably than he really wants to. Okay? And what, you, what I'm, what I'm going to do here to compare, to try to make it fair. Now, the, all the videos here, the angles are a little bit different. Okay? But if you really just pay attention and look closely, you can see the commonality of what I'm talking about. So we're going to start by each time marking a circle here at the heel. And then as the thrower strides out, we will mark another circle at the heel. And we will see this line of direction each time. All right, so there is Lincecum's line of direction. And you can see that even if we take this line away, that if he was striding completely optimal, which would be heel to heel, his foot, if we back up, there's his heel, would need to be somewhere here. And he is definitely landing closed. Okay, and he has done this throughout his entire career. Now, the reason why this is so important is because when the hips can fully open, the torso and particularly the release point have a direct path to get out in front of the body directly towards the target and allows for the most amount of consistency for any pitcher. Okay, and Lincecum throughout his entire career has landed close and now it's catching up with him because he's just not as quick. And this leads to not being able to get out in front of his body as consistently as he used to be because he's just not as quick. Now, let's go ahead and look at the predecessors here. We're going to start with Clemens. Now, this is a great view for us to look at because we can start circle on the heel, circle on the heel. There's his path. So you can see that his hips have fully opened. His torso is still back, but now, hey, he can fire directly towards home plate, which allows his body to get out in front as best as possible he can. We're going to move on. Let's go to David Cohn. Let me erase these. Now, this is a harder view to look from. We're still going to do the same process. Let's assume his heel is here. Then his heel is there. There's his path. Okay. 
again, if you just kind of look at how his hips here, where his knee is in relationship to his back foot, where his torso is, you can see that his hips are clearly open towards home plate, again, allowing his trunk to rotate directionally towards the target. Mike Messina. Let's draw, let's do the circle here on his heel. Circle here on his heel. There he is. Okay, very, very similar. Let's go to the next guy, Pedro. Circle moves into his throw. He's probably got the greatest amount of. Um, hip rotation and being ex extremely optimal in terms of being heel to heel so far with his alignments and as we know he's one of the best command pitchers we've seen in baseball history. Let's continue to move on. Tom Seaver. Let's mark the circle. There's the heel. Opens up. Can't even really see his foot so we know that these hips are fully opened. His shoulders are remaining closed, arms in a good position. Now he can do whatever he wants. He can go as hard as he wants in terms of driving his torso down towards the target, giving him that clear path. Lastly, Kurt Schilling. Same thing. Circle. Opens up. Circle. There you go. Okay. So every single one of these predecessors guys that have had results for 15 plus years, all of their hips opened, okay? Some of the guys, just like Linscombe, Schillen does it a little bit, Lucina did it, Clemens did it. Uh, they all had thoracic extension just like Linscombe. If we go back to Linscombe, if you really look when his foot hits, he has to, he has to really bend more than he needs to to overcompensate for his stroke, his closed stride. If Linskim didn't have this great thoracic extension, his command would be far worse than it is now. Okay, so the biggest adjustment for me is the stride direction. But the stride direction has everything to do with how he moves into that lift, just like we talked about in step one. He thinks that his hips are moving towards the center of the plate or the middle third, the outer third, towards home plate. But in essence, he's always landing close, and he has to make a major adjustment within his torso to get back to where he needs to be. So these two things, this one is step two with the stride alignment, is I think if Lincecum would be able to stop over-rotating, allow his hips to travel, directionally towards home plate, he would land with a better alignment and allow his torso, he can still have this great thoracic extension that he has, still stay deceptive plenty, and he would, he would be able to more consistently generate the force that he's looking for and cut down on his walks and produce more consistent results. Seriously, I think he'll make Hall of Fame. He lasts any only time he'll make the Hall of Fame. I, I grew up with the old saying of it's not what you've done for him, it's what you've done for him lately. Tim's right. In the world of sports, it's all about what have you done for me lately. And lately, Tim Linscomb hasn't done much at all. I know the San Francisco Giants would love to see Tim Linscomb pitch well into his 30s. But the adjustments that Tim needs to make need to happen now and not later. This video may never find Tim Lincecum, but if it does, I hope he evaluates and realizes that his predecessors never over-rotated their shoulders, always maintained a clean arm swing, and as they moved towards home plate, their stride alignment was ideal. Tom Seaver, one of Lincecum's predecessors, viewed pitching as an art. Lincecum's delivery in itself is a piece of art. But it's an unfinished piece of art. In order to make his piece of art a masterpiece that will allow him to pitch 10 more years and potentially get into the Hall of Fame, Lincecum must make adjustments. He may never 
be able to pitch at 98 miles per hour again. But I know that Tim Lincecum has enough talent, deception, and desire to allow him the opportunity to continue to pitch well into his 30s just like his predecessors.